Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And bless us in God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. That the Lord and the Lord God stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have planned for you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning 
and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the place Bethel. The word of the Lord. Our psalm today is a portion of Psalm 139. And we'll read by the traditional half verse. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You trace my journeys and my resting places. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. You press upon me behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Where can I go from your spirit? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning, even there your hand will lead me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me. Darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Look well whether there be any wickedness in me. Our second reading is a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope, we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will be thrown and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Every gardener knows the importance of getting rid of the weeds. It's just something we have to do. And so does God. Now, let's face it, though. Most of us recoil at the idea of a God of judgment. And that's why this morning's gospel parable of Jesus is not a favorite. Even so, sooner or later, we have to answer that question. What about the weeds? We don't like considering another human being a uh, or as a likely candidate for such a designation. And yet, we might concede that there might, in fact, be a few who would fit. Torquemada, for instance, of the medieval church's Inquisition. Adolf Hitler. Pol Pot of the killing fields in Cambodia. Idi Amin of Uganda. Maybe... Abu Bakr Shekau of Boko Haram in Nigeria, perhaps. 
There is, however, another way of looking at this parable, a way that potentially could make us even more uncomfortable than considering candidates for weed designation. And that way is to look at ourselves. What about the evil within? The hatreds, the bigotries, envies, bitterness, lust, anger, greed, and so on. Thinking that way got me to thinking about that young schoolgirl who wrote an essay at school about evolution. And she wrote, according to this understanding, humanity descended with the apes and has been descending ever since. You know, there's some truth in that, isn't there? What about the weeds in us? Our concern this morning is not about the final judgment that Jesus describes here, when the wheat and the weeds will be separated. For most of us, that is a matter that is, has already been settled. By faith, we know whose and who we are. By faith, we know that we belong to the Lord. By God's grace, we know that we are part of the wheat of God's field. We take comfort in that knowledge whenever we come across a passage like this. Our salvation, however, does not keep weeds out of the garden of our own character and soul. So how do we deal with those weeds? Those pesky personality defects? those murky moral letdowns, those tawdry times of ethical failure that keep us from being all that God would have us be. For you see, God has created you and me to be persons of strong inner character with sturdy souls that can stand up to the harsh realities of life. Or to use the biblical analogy suggested in our parables this morning, a hearty, abundant field or garden bearing fruit whose taste is sweet and refreshing, or bursting forth with blossoms whose beauty is pleasing to the eye of God. How do we get rid of those weeds and become that sturdy soul, that beautiful garden that Christ intends us to be? Well, the first thing to recognize is how weeds grow. Weeds grow without effort. We all know that if you have to weed a garden. That's the key to spotting them. No one goes out and plants a weed. No one cultivates it or waters it or sees to it it gets enough sunshine. Weeds require no labor. They get started and grow unnoticed, and that's how they succeed. Weeds remind me of that mindless bit of philosophy that was so popular in the 60s, and many of you will remember it, uh, it's now accepted as unquestioned dogma. If it feels good, do it. And if you think that, uh, if you have any doubts that that's pervasive in our culture, just consider this gem that says it in just a slightly different way from one of the great gurus of our time, Yoda. Use your mind not. Trust your feelings, you must. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> now, now, I love Star Wars, okay? But, you know, that's a certain recipe for failure. If we did only what felt good, we would become physical, moral, mental, and spiritual wrecks. The things worth having in life require effort. Beware of anything in life that requires no commitment. We're probably dealing with a weed. But once recognized, how do we get rid of those weeds? What does it take to become God's beautiful garden? To become that strong person within, that sturdy soul? Well, it takes three steps. A vision, a plan, and a commitment to cultivate. You know, there are some people who take better care of their lawns than they do their lives. <laughs> Somehow they don't see that the same principles are involved in both tasks. So let's begin with that first step, vision. In order to have a beautiful lawn or a hardy field or a garden, we begin with a mental idea of what we hope to achieve, a vision. We picture the finished product. 
well, if it's a garden, uh, the roses and begonias or the tomatoes and cucumbers and the borders and the walkways. But do we have that same clear-cut vision for our lives? If we need help forming that detailed picture of our inner lives, of what the very character of our soul should look like, remember this, the ultimate Christian image is Jesus himself. The character traits found in him are to form our templates. Capturing that strong vision of Christ in us, of our inner selves becoming more and more Christ-like, is the first step, the vision. And here's the second step, a plan. That beautiful garden, that strong inner person, sturdy soul requires a plan. You know, there was once a great Quaker leader by the name of Rufus Jones. Jones wrote and published one book each year for over 50 years. He did this while holding a college professorship, attending countless meetings, making frequent speeches, editing a magazine, and taking care of the countless other chores that his position required. Someone once asked him where he found the time to write so many books. And he answered, I wrote my books on Tuesdays. <laughs> now, that sounds kind of <laughs> obtuse, obviously. But what he meant by that was that throughout his career, he set aside Tuesdays as his one cleared day, accepting no appointments that could be avoided. He began his work after breakfast, and he wrote until dark. Now, he might be thinking about his next project all week long, but he didn't put it down on paper until Tuesday. And by following that simple plan, he left behind a great body of work. Now, we've all heard it before, because it's true. Those who fail to plan, plan to fail. You know, even Jesus talked about the foolishness of those who build towers without first planning the steps and counting the cost. Successful spiritual living requires that we give some thought to our future. We have a vision of that garden that we hope to be in Jesus, and now we make a plan. What would I have to do to grow into his image? Prayer is really critical here. God is very good about revealing to us what needs to be worked on first, if we'll ask him, and revealing what will follow. And God will direct the Holy Spirit, already at work in you and in me, to give us the power and the wisdom to act on what is revealed. So, ask God to show you what to work on first, and ask for the Spirit's help and wisdom for the planning. That's the second step, to true inner strength of character and sturdiness of soul, to becoming that hardy field, that beautiful garden within. And here's the third step. Make a commitment to cultivate this plan for life. A famous football coach once said, I have a job to do that is not very complicated, but it is difficult. To get a group of men to do what they don't want to do so that they achieve the one thing they have wanted all their lives. Cultivating our lives and souls requires those daily little tasks that sometimes can be a pain. You know, remembering to pray, remembering to read our Bibles, remembering to spend time with the Lord. All these things that are little things. And yet, we find ourselves so often at the end of the day going, oops, I forgot. Well, but we are to do them. Because in our mind's eye, we can see the beauty and the bounty that awaits us if we do. And that, of course, is what disciplined living is all about. Some people don't understand the nature of discipline. They think of it as mindless slavery to meaningless activity. But disciplined living is not mindless routine. It is commitment to the cultivation of the plan to the man or the woman who has caught a vision of life's purpose. 
So, heed Jesus' warning about weeds. He loves us. And that's why he would have us be free of them, so that we can grow and flourish. I once knew an organic farmer who had a crop beset by an infestation of beetles. And he set about loosing that beetle's carnivorous insect enemy to save his fields. The farmer's little girl was upset by her father, with her father for killing all those helpless little bugs that way. He patiently explained that their family was dependent upon those crops of the fields and that the beetles could literally cause them to starve. You see, said the father, I'm against the beetles because I'm for our fields. And that's God's attitude. He is against the weeds in our lives because he is for us. Isn't it time we got rid of the weeds that so easily come into our lives? Weeds are the enemy of a sturdy soul, that beautiful garden, whether that garden is a good marriage or the sanctity and health of our bodies or our relationships with our families or our progress and our vocation or avocation or most importantly of all, our relationship with God. But we can be freed with Jesus as our vision, the cultivation of his life in us as our plan, and a life given to growth as our commitment. Weeds require no effort, but they sure can choke out the work of a lifetime. A beautiful garden, a strong inner person and soul, on the other hand requires vision, planning, and commitment. So let's get weed whacking. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our trust in God by reciting the Nicene Creed together as it's found on page 8 of our bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all the days seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he has worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all our work, justice, freedom, and peace. 
for the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For all those who minister to the sick, the righteous, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the cure. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Catherine, our presiding bishop, Michael and Anne, our bishops, for Rick, our priest, and for all bishops and other ministers. And for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we especially pray for Plum Trent, Marion Seyfried, Anne Montaigne, Bob Nichols, Patrick Haley, Elaine Cook, Bob Love, Jamie Jackson, Catherine Conte, Beth Ely, Ezra Robertson, Rusty City, Eric Philippe, Alex Smith, Don Gord, Daryl Washburn, Shelby Washburn, Jimmy Trotter, Mitch Martin, Amber Yanis, Daniel Clevis, Mike Cooper, Gene Burns, Jerry Montaigne, Frida Watt, Francis Robertson, Dottie Worth, Mike Joyce, Dale Belcher, and Carol Pruitt. Lord, have mercy. And we also pray for all those serving in the armed forces of our nation, especially Randy Williamson, Ethan Rogers, Heather Meyer Galana, Jericho Galana, Amanda Altman, Michael McCloskey, Ben Shepard, Wesley Welch, Spencer and Monet Wilson, Ralph Lee Clayton, Patty Bethay, Lathrop Smith IV, Katie Curran, Christina Bazzacco, Charles Spencer, Bo Bethay, Adam Wilson, Tommy Mancino, Edward Allen, Lance Hash, Chris Miles, Robert Murray, Jim Doniker, Caleb Butt, and Roger Greer. Lord, protect them from harm and shield them in danger. Hear us, O Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We give thanks for the lives of Louise and Knox Lively, in whose memory the altar flowers are given. We pray for those celebrating birthdays this week. Chris Hicks, Leif Smith, Helen Thorne, Christ Watt, Jane Potter. Lord, we thank you. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, and your compassion forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
glad that you could join us too. Um, a special thank you to all of those who showed up this week to uh, behead all that shrimp. Uh, Carson went and got about 400 pounds of shrimp for us, and then a crew of us got together in the kitchen and for a few hours just were popping and cleaning shrimp. And so there is definitely going to be a shrimp fest this year. Uh, early on in September, we'll have the date. As soon as we do, we'll start announcing that uh, so it's out there. But thank you to all of you who came in and did that. We're grateful. Um, today uh, is a, uh, 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 let me just say, yes, I'm going to embarrass you. It's my last chance. Um, this is Caitlin's last Sunday with us. And she's going to be taking off this next Saturday for Portland, Oregon, uh, where she's going to be going to school and pursue her studies. And uh, what's that? That's what? Oh, uh, yeah, becoming a doctor. Yeah, that's sort of, uh, of uh, occupational therapy. So at any rate, yeah. Okay. Anyway, she's got, uh, so, uh, uh, so you, you let her know and just, uh, you know, say bye. Wish her well, and please do pray for safe travel. She's taking the dog with her, and hopefully the dog will travel well. That's the thing we're <laughs> most concerned about. Um, and, uh, but at, at the same time, in a couple of weeks, our oldest daughter, Megan, and her husband are leaving California and coming back this way, moving to Middleburg, Virginia. And uh, uh, we're really thrilled about that, too, because they, they went and uh, auditioned at the National Cathedral and have both been signed on by the National Cathedral as uh, uh, soloists uh, for the cathedral. So, uh, yeah, we're proud of them, too. Yeah. <laughs> They're that good. Yeah, okay, anyway. Um, anyway, any other announcements this morning? Lemonade will be inside. Lemonade's inside? Because we don't want extra water in it? Ah, got it. Okay, so right next door, after the service, come on over this way. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. And you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me.
Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and ending life in him. And sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the sin of our enemy bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be the peace. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. 